Well, hello, family of God, children of the highest. This is Philip Shields, and thank you for coming. We're very, very pleased to have Light on the Rock be part of the message of what's going out to the whole world. My very first sermon that I ever gave on Light on the Rock in 2004, almost 20 years ago, uh, was, a, was this very topic. What is the true, complete gospel? Because I saw that so many groups out there were preaching a gospel that was not complete, uh, sometimes wasn't even true, but mostly was not complete. And almost all Christians know the word gospel, that it means good news, I think we know that, and we know that it has to do with either the message of and about Jesus Christ or the kingdom of God or other things, but I want to put it all together because I really believe the true gospel is much broader than people realize much broader, as you'll see, and I'm going to back up everything I say today by Scripture, what, God, what, what the Bible calls the complete or the whole counsel of God, the whole counsel of God. So it means good news, and you know, it was such good news that people were willing to die for this at one time. Die for it. Would you and I be willing to die for the gospel that you believe, that your church teaches? And maybe we don't uh, fully grasp it, the full meaning of it, we're not as excited about it as, as they were, as we should be. And yet we find that whole church groups have split apart because of variances on what they believe their definition and their church statement of beliefs should state about the gospel. Some are very adamant that the gospel is about just the kingdom of God, nothing else, not about Jesus. They preach Jesus, but they define the gospel as not about Jesus, but just the kingdom of God. And I'll talk about that as we go through it. <clears throat> Others insist it's what it says, the good news of Jesus Christ, the good news of Christ, the gospel of Christ. They believe it's, it's they on the other hand, go the other ditch. It's just about Jesus, not about something else. It's not about the kingdom. It's, Jesus is the whole gospel, complete gospel, need nothing else. That's it, as, as some put it. So they don't try to preach or focus at all on the kingdom of God, or if they do, they think it's about going to heaven when you die. Others insist that it's both about the kingdom of God and about Jesus Christ, his life, his purpose, his mission as Savior and King, totally Lord of our lives. He's in charge of our life. So which one is it out of all of those? Or, or are there more? I want to ask you also this question. What about the, go the good news, the gospel, what about it makes it good news? What about the gospel of Christ makes it good news? What about the gospel of the kingdom makes it good news? How is it good news to you? And um, we're usually excited about really good news if, if we understand it. And if we can be a part of that good news. So if somebody told me that there's a guy downtown who's handing out million dollars, a million dollars to anybody who comes up to him, and it's a true story, let's just say it is. How is that good news? How will I feel it's good news? Unless I receive that million dollars as well, and I'm a part of that. If we can get a piece of the action, as we say, if we're involved in it, in the kingdom of God, in Jesus Christ, Maybe that would be more good news. But I don't feel, as I look around in the church today, that enough people are very excited about the gospel, the good news. Is there a way that we can make it exciting? That it's true. So what I'm going to try to do today is not try to preach just a belief of a particular group or a booklet, what a booklet might say or what you might read on the internet. What I want to do today is have this be like Acts 20, 27 says, Paul describing his own preaching. He said, I gave you the whole counsel of God, the whole, the whole kit and caboodle, everything. So I didn't leave anything out. So this, I want this gospel teaching to be the whole counsel of God, Acts 20, 27. Plus, this is so important that I wanted to have this updated video version. So we have a video of it. Now, so what? What's the big deal? So you believe this about the gospel, someone believes something else about the gospel. 
What's the big deal? So what? Well, according to Galatians 1, and I'll post it here, Galatians 1, Paul actually pronounced a double curse. He says it twice. If anyone preaches, even if an angel preaches a gospel different than what I preached, may they be accursed. May they be anathema. So let's read it. Galatians 1, the end of verse 2, all the way through verse 9. To all the brethren with me, to the churches in Turkey, Galatia, okay? Grace to you and peace from God the Father and our Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins, that he might deliver us from this present evil age, according to the will of God and Father, to whom he to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Now, verse 6. <clears throat> I want you to carefully look at the verbiage, the wording, the words used here in Galatians 1, verse 6. I marvel you're turning away so soon from him who called you, that would be God the Father, in the grace of Christ. You're turning away from your calling, from God the Father, in the grace of the good news, the favor, the pardon, the grace of Christ to a different gospel. Is he not even just, just defining the gospel right there? The grace of Christ to a different message, a different gospel, which is not another. But there are some who trouble you and want to pervert the good news gospel of Christ. But even if an angel does that, let him be a curse. If anyone else comes, even if I say it again, he says, I'm going to say it now. If anyone preaches any other gospel to you other than what you have already received, let him be accursed. Then jumping to verse 15, when it pleased God who separated me from my mother's womb and called me through his grace to reveal his son in me, to reveal his son in me, that I might preach him among the Gentiles. I want you to note, he doesn't say that I may preach some other thing or even the kingdom here. It, it, he doesn't. He said that I might preach him among the Gentiles. I didn't immediately confer with flesh and blood. I didn't talk, I didn't talk about it with other people. In this case, he speaks of the grace of Christ several times as being the gospel. And you'll see that in 1 Corinthians later that how he defines his gospel he says, I'm going to tell you what I told you was the gospel. And he tells us. The gospel really is the plan of God to invite all those he has opened the minds to and decided to call at this time. A people in, into a family. Remember that a kingdom is a family that's grown large. So the kingdom of Israel started with Isaac and then Jacob, who had 12 sons. Jacob was renamed Israel. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and their 12 sons, a family, and they became numerous and became a kingdom at some point. Same thing with the kingdom of God. Right now it's composed of God the Father and his son. And the angels, they're, they're part of that too, I guess. But the kingdom, they're, not, they're, they're servants in that kingdom. But a kingdom is initially a family grown large. That process involves being called, us in accepting that call, repenting of our sins, asking God to wash away our sins in the blood of Jesus Christ, accepting the risen Christ to be our life because he is the way, the truth, and the life. Did you know that there are even verses that say we must obey the gospel, like 2 Thessalonians 1.8 and others that I'll post. The gospel also includes a lot of teaching of the way we should go, how to live, God's kingdom's way. There's a lot more to the Gospels, what I'm trying to say, than what most of us probably teach and believe. There's a lot more to it. If we could really absorb it, how wonderful it is, I think we'd be so excited we'd have, we'd have a hard time falling asleep at night. I really do. So I will do all I can, led by God's Spirit in me, to do just that. Make it exciting. So you think, wow, I didn't know it was that big of a deal to have the true gospel. So today we'll define the gospel and what it is. We'll see some descriptions of the gospel throughout scripture and the ones that the phrases, the descriptive phrases that are used the most and all of them apply, whether it's used once or just 
10 times or 12 times or whatever. And then in part two, I'll, I'll talk about what the apostles actually preached after they were told to go out to all the world preaching the gospel. What did they actually preach to obey that command? And I'll also talk about in part two, how the gospel was something that was preached from the Garden of Eden onwards. The Old Testament had the gospel. It really did. And you'll see that, how even Abraham, Jesus said, Abraham uh, rejoiced to see my day. He saw it and was glad, John 8, 56. So now let's look at the most common phrases that are defined as the gospel. But before we do, let's read that again. Mark 16, verses 15 to 16. I alluded to it, but didn't read it. Mark 16, verses 15 and 16 on your screen. He said to them, go into all the world and preach the gospel. He doesn't define gospel here. He just says, preach it. The good news to every creature. He who believes and is baptized will be saved. And he who does not believe will be condemned. So they're told to go out and preach it. And so now let's look at how Luke describes his commission. Luke 24, verses 44 to 49. Um, and then he said to them, the same timing here. In Luke, he doesn't say preach the gospel, but he does say this in Luke's account. Then he said to them, these are the words which I spoke to you while I was still with you, that all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms concerning me. And he opened their understanding that they might understand the scriptures. And then he said to them, it's written, it was necessary for Christ, the anointed one, to suffer, for the Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day, and that repentance and remission of sin should be preached in his name to all nations beginning at Jerusalem. And you're witnesses of these things. It goes on from there. So he says, stay though in Jerusalem until you receive the promise of the Father, which was the Holy Spirit, of course. So they're both told, both accounts talk about going to all the world. And in Luke, he talks about, hey, it's concerning me. And, uh, and, and preach also repentance and remission of sins, because you can't accept Jesus as your Savior until you repent. You can't be in the kingdom until you repent and receive forgiveness. Now, the most often used phrase in the Bible for the good news, it's used 10 times exactly this way, the gospel, the good news of Jesus. I mean, the gospel of Christ, I mean, the gospel of Christ. If you add the phrases, the gospel of Jesus Christ, and the gospel of the glory of Christ, and the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, now you have 13 times where the gospel of Christ, or slight variations of it, are pronounced. 13 times in all the Bible, far more than any other description. Some interpret good news of Christ to mean it was just the message he brought, which they say was those who believe very, very strongly that the good news is simply about the kingdom of God. They say that that's what Jesus preached and that's all he preached because there are three verses that say he came preaching the kingdom of God, the gospel of the kingdom of God. Some interpret that to mean that that's only what he preached. They even go so far, some, some have, of saying he never preached about himself. And when I hear that in a sermon, I'm going, what? Are they reading the same Bible I'm reading? Never said anything about himself? Some groups are so adamant the good news is strictly about the coming kingdom of God, they don't even read any verses that describe it as anything other than the kingdom. Preaching the gospel. But first, is it true that Jesus never spoke about himself? As some groups out there do teach. I just showed you in Luke 24's version, he says everything that was said in the, in the prophets and Psalms concerning me, Luke 24, 44. How about if you go through, especially the book of John, where you have the, the I am's of John. I am, what, the bread of life. I am the vine. I am the door. I am the good shepherd. 
What else? I am the life. I am the light of the world. I am the way, the truth, and the life. All of those are about himself. Several times he just simply said, I am. And he said, I am the son of my father. My father is God in heaven. Almost got himself stoned for that. He says, carry your cross, come follow me. Don't you dare deny me, because if you deny me, I'll deny you before the angels. One cannot read the Gospels and claim he did not preach himself. You go through the whole Passover service. I mean, it's all there, but I'm the vine, and, and uh, in me shall have peace. And um, I don't give peace like the world gives, and I don't give the world gives. Love one another as I have loved you. And all of these things that you'll find in John 13 through 8, 17, uh, about the, the Last Supper, the, the, the Last Passover that he had with them. And if you go through John chapter by chapter, John 3, Nicodemus, you must be born from above and you must receive, uh, be born of spirit, water and spirit. And all these things. And in John 3, I think it's verse 37, he says, those who believe on me have everlasting life. What's wrong with that? And then also when, uh, after, the, after, the, uh, after that in John 4, the woman at the well the first person I believe that he identified himself to as being the Messiah. She said, we're looking for the Messiah. She said, I who speak to you am he. I am that Messiah. She was so happy and astounded by that news that she left her pitcher of water and went running into the city. He stayed there a couple more days telling them about himself and his mission. So by the time you get to John 8, there's all kinds of statements in John 8 about himself. And then finally, uh, like I say, when you go through the, uh, the, the Last Supper and then in his trial in front of Caiaphas, he said, you'll see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with great glory. And then after the resurrection, <clears throat> what did he say? What did he say? He said to the men on the road to Emmaus, that starting with Moses and all the way through the prophets, he told them all about the things that concerned him. Okay? That's in Luke 24, verse 27. Beginning with Moses and the prophets, he expounded to them all the scriptures concerning himself. So, of course, Jesus spoke about himself. Of course he did. So the good news of Christ is also very much about him, his mission, and his purpose. Let's turn now to 2 Corinthians 4.4. 4. Some churches that I've been part of always talk about the first part, the God of this world and Satan, and don't read the rest of the verse. So he talks about how the gospel can be veiled. Then verse 4, among those whose minds the God of this age is blinded, who do not believe. This is the part that doesn't get read in the groups that believe only in the kingdom of God being the gospel. Who, okay, lest the light of the good news, the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ. The light of the good news, the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is in the image of God, should shine upon them. For we don't preach ourselves, but Christ, Jesus, the Lord, and so on. So, the gospel of the glory of Christ. That's got to be included in any definition of the gospel. So many sermons I checked out never even mentioned that verse. The good news of the glory of Christ. Because they say that of Christ means belonging to. Well, glory. You're talking about the glory of Christ. It's about Him. The good news of Christ also shows us why it's such good news. It shows us the way that we can be part of that kingdom. It shows us that as bad as I've been or you've been, the sins we've committed, because of Jesus Christ, I can have those washed away, wiped out, covered. Many words that are used. Cleansed. Taken away. As far as east is from the west. There's no good news unless I can feel a part of it, right? We need the way of salvation. We need the way into eternal life. We need to know how we can be part of all of that. The good news is how you can be part of the good news. The, 
the way is Christ. So are you getting it? It's also about the good news of Christ, but that's also about the grace of God. It's all part of it. That's the gospel too. Yes, the amazing grace is the good news that God is giving us, that we can have our sins forgiven, that the perfect being, the Son of God, took our sins upon himself and has completely removed every taint of any sin we've ever committed. So that involved Jesus. So, no grace, there's no kingdom. There's no good news. No Jesus, there's no good news. I was corrected by a minister one time who called me or emailed me or something some years ago. And he said, Philip, I understand that you're preaching the gospel of grace. There is no such phrase in the Bible, gospel of grace. You really need to admit that and stop teaching it. He says, I looked it up in a concordance. It's not there. So I said to him, if you look up gospel of grace, you're right. It's not there. But if you look up just the word grace, you'll find it because it's the gospel of the grace of God. Because he didn't have the word the in there, he didn't see it. Let's read it. Acts 20, 23 to 25, talking to the Ephesian uh, elders. Chains and tribulations await me, verse 24, but none of these things move me, nor do I count my life as dear to myself, so that I may finish my race with joy and the ministry which I received from the Lord Jesus to testify, here it is, to testify of the good news of the gospel of the grace of God. Another verse that doesn't get included in the many sermons I've listened to about the gospel among those groups that teach it's only the kingdom of God. They don't use this verse. The gospel of the grace of God. Some do, and I didn't hear those. The phrase gospel of grace is obviously about grace of God. Of grace means about, in this case, is what I'm saying. No grace, no kingdom. No favor of God, no eternal life. No forgiveness. No good news without grace. On the other hand, some of you teach the true gospel is only about Jesus. You go in the other ditch. It's not only about Jesus. Some of you have said, I've heard sermons where it says, the entirety of the gospel is Jesus Christ. Starts with him, ends with him, that's it. And you have verses to back up what you're saying, but you're not doing the whole counsel of God, including the many, many verses that I'm talking about later on. That's good that you talk about the gospel of Christ, it's largely about him, but we have to preach the whole counsel of God and I'm hoping all of you who preach that it's only about Jesus will listen carefully because there's much more to it than just that. What was Jesus saving us for? What was it for? Okay. Um, and those of you, on the other hand, who insist the good news is not about Jesus, I warn you, be very careful that you're not falling into the description of someone who denies Christ. Luke 12, verse 8 and 9. When we minimize him at all, you could be on thin ice. Those of you who preach it's the kingdom of God, please see this. Luke 12, verse 8 and 9. In fact, right here he's preaching himself. I say to you, whoever confesses me before men, him the Son of Man will also confess before the angels of God. But he who denies me before men will be denied before the angels of God. So don't find yourself doing that. One more thing about the gospel of Christ, about his life, his death, his resurrection. Is that the gospel? Paul said it was. And remember, I already read to you in Galatians 1, where he said there's a curse of anyone preaching a different gospel. He says, how soon you've been removed and moved from the grace of Christ to a different gospel. So let's read 1 Corinthians 15, verse 1 and 2. Moreover, brethren, I declare to you the gospel I preached to you. I'm going to tell you what the gospel was that I preached. It's plain English. 
plain Greek, whatever it was, which also you received and in which you stand, by which you are also saved. This gospel includes salvation. Isn't it interesting that our Savior's name, Yeshua, Jesus, means Savior. Okay. By which you're saved if you hold fast the word which I preached to you unless you believed in vain. Now verse 3 to 8. I delivered to you first of all that which I also received. This is the gospel, verse 1, which I preached to you. That Christ died for our sins and that he was buried and that he Okay, that he was, uh, start over, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, rose again the third day according to the scriptures, and that he was seen by Peter, Cephas, then by the twelve. After that he was seen by over 500, most of them are still alive. Verse 7, after that he was seen by James, then by all the apostles. Then verse 8, then last of all he was seen by me also as by one born out of season, out of time. Let me declare to you my gospel. I delivered first of all, verse 2 and 3, verse 3, that Christ died for our sins. Paul says that's the gospel. And he gives, he's the one who gives the curse if you preach a different wrong gospel. That was his gospel. And then in verse 12, 1 Corinthians 15, 12, now if Christ is preached, it doesn't say if the kingdom is preached. If Christ is preached that he has been raised from the dead, how do some of you say there's no resurrection? But Paul does go on through the rest of chapter 15 to talk about each one being resurrected in his own order, each one coming to God in his own order, verses 20 to 29. And he talks about the immortality and the resurrection and being changed in a blink of an eye. Yes, he talks about the kingdom. He talks about resurrection. But he said the core of his preaching of the gospel, verses 1 and 2 and 3, is that Christ died for our sins and was resurrected. Romans 1, be sure that you're not in any way acting like you're ashamed or reluctant to speak of Jesus. Romans 1, 16, 17, I'm not ashamed of the good news of Jesus, the good news of Christ. It's the power of God to salvation to everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also to the Greek. Be sure you're not ashamed to call it the gospel of Christ, for in it the righteousness of God, not the righteousness you attain to, the righteousness of God that is imputed to us as Romans 4, almost every verse in Romans 4, especially verse 20, 21, 22, it wasn't imputed just to Abraham, but to all of us who believe. Romans 5, 17, the gift of God's righteousness. Okay, it's the righteousness of God, His righteousness that we get to have covering us. Something not often preached by those who believe we got to work our way into the kingdom. No, we don't. We're saved by grace through faith, not of works, lest any man should boast. Ephesians 2, verse 8 and 9. Romans 16, 25. Now to him who is able to establish you according to my gospel, which he said was the death and resurrection of Christ, He's able to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ. According to the revelation of the mystery that kept secret since the world began. So number one, use 13 times, 10 times the gospel of Christ. 13 times if you include the good news of Christ. The, um, I, I mean uh, the glory of the, uh, the gospel of the glory of Christ or the gospel of Jesus Christ or the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. 13 times. The second most common descriptor of the gospel is the gospel of God, God's good news. Good news, that descriptor is used seven times, eight times if you use the phrase gospel of the blessed God, the happy God, the blessed God. 
1 Timothy 1.1 1, 1 talks about the gospel of the blessed God. Let's read the first time that gospel of God is used and what it was about. Romans 1 verses 1 to 4. Paul, a slave, bondservant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated to the gospel of God, which he promised before through his servants. Separated for the good news of God, of God's good news, concerning, about, referring to his son, Jesus Christ our Lord. You can go on reading from there. My point is, he says, this gospel of God, Romans 1.3, is concerning his son, Jesus Christ. So Paul here says it's about Jesus, Yeshua. That's what the Bible says. Please let that sink in, those of you who insist that the true gospel is only about the kingdom of God. Preach the whole counsel of God. I just gave you one. We might come back to some of these concepts, but notice that Paul says the gospel was promised also through the Old Testament prophets. He says that in Romans 1. Other verses talk about it being a gospel that must be believed. So be aware. Number one, the gospel of Christ, the good news of Christ, which I think includes about Christ, as I've given you many examples now, that he went about preaching himself many, many, many places and times. Many places. This is my, take this bread, this is my body broken for you. Take this cup, this is my blood shed for you. Drink of it. He's talking about himself, of course he is. Gospel number two, most frequently used is the gospel of God, eight times. Seven plus the blessed God makes it eight. Finally, number three. Yep, number three. Used four times, and only four times and only in the gospel accounts. The gospel of the kingdom. We're told three times Jesus came preaching the gospel of the kingdom. And then, um, that term, gospel of the kingdom, let this sink in, is never used in any of the epistles of Paul in the book of Acts, the gospel of the kingdom. The kingdom of God is mentioned several times, of course. But the phrase gospel of the kingdom is never used in the epistles, is never used in Revelation, never used in Acts. Although kingdom of God is mentioned quite a few times, but not the gospel of the kingdom. Kingdom of God is actually mentioned 70 times, but as being the gospel, four times, four, that's it. Perhaps the most famous statement of the four statements is Matthew 24, 14. And I totally, totally preaching the whole counsel of God, accept this, love this, and excited about it, accept it. And this gospel of the kingdom, this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all nations. And then the end will come. Absolutely, I believe that and preach that. So the gospel of the kingdom is an extremely important part of the true gospel, of the complete gospel. Once the true good news of the kingdom, which includes the message of Jesus and what he did for us, his life, his resurrection, his salvation, his taking our sins upon himself, and the kingdom of God that this is, allows us to be a part of, once that's preached in Russia, China, North Korea, in the Islamic countries, in the Hindu and Buddhist countries, as well as the Christian countries who need to hear the true gospel, the end will come. I suppose part of that will be fulfilled by the two witnesses. I'm just speculating out loud. Why not? And then Revelation 14, verse 6 and 7, talks about an angel who's going to show up preaching this gospel called the everlasting gospel. And in this angel's gospel, the words gospel of Christ, the words son of God, 
the words kingdom of God are not even used. That's why I'm saying give the whole counsel of God everything said about the gospel. Revelation 14, 6 and 7. Then I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to everyone, to preach to all those who dwell on the earth, to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people. And he said with a loud voice, this was his good, this was his good news. Fear God, give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment has come. Worship him who made heaven and earth, the sea and springs of water. That was the everlasting gospel. The whole counsel of God. Let's include that. Now this might surprise you again. The gospel of the kingdom are never again repeated in any of the epistles or revelations, never mentioned anywhere else. So there's got to be more to the good news than just the kingdom of God. And I want you to get this too. The gospel of the kingdom is not good news to you or to me if you and I have no part or way into it. What's exciting is to learn about this kingdom, which I'll do in a lot more in part two, learn a lot more about it, and then to realize how you have a part in it, that you've been called to be part of it, and what that means to you. It's not good news unless I have a part in it. If someone's handing out million dollar checks out or, or, or money to people downtown, it's not good news to me unless I'm shown a way to get to that person and get my own million dollars as well. This is worth a lot more than a million dollars, this gospel of the kingdom, this gospel of Christ, this everlasting gospel, this gospel of God. It's not good news unless I know a part how to, how to get in it, and learning about Jesus is the way into it. Now, understand this. The Jews of Jesus' day understood the gospel of the kingdom to mean that he was saying the kingdom of Israel was about to be restored. They could read about King David becoming back, coming back to rule Israel again. They could read about the lion and the lamb and the goat and the, and the, and the leopard and the, what, the, the little child leading them and not being bitten by dangerous snakes in Isaiah 11. They could read about that. They could read and know about how all nations were going to go up to Jerusalem and worship the king, learn about his way, and each man will, and they'll beat plowshares, I mean, uh, swords and spears into plowshares, and each man will sit under his own fig tree. Micah 4, verses 1 to 5. Isaiah 2, verses 1 to 4. But Jesus seemed in no hurry to set up his kingdom to, of restoring Israel as the kingdom of God. They knew about, they knew about Exodus 19, you shall be to me, a, a, for me, or to me, a kingdom of priests. They knew about that. And so, but he wasn't setting that up. The Romans were still harassing them, ruling over them. Their hated Edomian from Edom, Herod, was ruling over them. Even John the Baptist wondered. He had spoken out against Herod and, and the, taking, taking some, his brother's wife. He was put in jail. Jesus, he felt, could easily have got him out of jail with miracles. But nothing was happening. So in Luke 7, verses 18 to 19, then the disciples of John reported, reported to him, to John, concerning all these things, that Jesus was healing the sick, raising the dead, and all these things. John, yeah, but he's not delivering me. and He's not setting up his kingdom. He's not restoring the kingdom of Israel, is what John's thinking. And so John called two of his disciples, sent them to Jesus, saying, they wanted to ask him, are you the coming one, or do we look for, not, for someone else? Jesus, are you going to do the job or not? Are you the coming one, or do we look for someone else? John the Baptist doubted for a second or two. <laughs> Restoring Israel was forefront also in the minds of the apostles, right after the resurrection. Acts 1, verses 4 to 6, especially verse 6. But they got all together with Christ, 
And he commands them, don't depart from Jerusalem till you've received the Holy Spirit. Okay, verses 4 and 5. Now Acts 1, verse 6, Therefore, when they had come together, they asked him. He had just told them about being immersed in the Holy Spirit. They should have been so super excited about that if they had fully understood it. But instead they asked, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? To them, that's what kingdom of God meant. The kingdom of God was Israel on earth, Exodus 19. You shall be to me a kingdom of priests. Even today, Jews say that Jesus did not, could not have been Messiah because he didn't set up his kingdom. In fact, he died. But first, they didn't know that he had to come first as a suffering servant and take our sins upon himself and die for us and then come back again this time on an angelic charger, taking over, taking charge of the earth, and being our new life for that matter. So Matthew, who wrote to the Jews primarily, was trying, I believe, it doesn't say this in, anywhere in Scripture, but I believe, I'm speculating a little bit, that to get them off of thinking, restoring the kingdom to Israel right then and there in Jerusalem, he started using a phrase that only he uses, nobody else does. It's not used anywhere in the rest of the New Testament. Kingdom of heaven. He used it 32 times. Now the kingdom of heaven has always existed. There's never been a time there wasn't a kingdom of heaven. Kingdom of God, in other words, has always existed. When we pray thy kingdom come, the kingdom that is now in heaven, we're praying will come to earth, and it will, Revelation 21-22. When, there, when there's new heavens and new earth. But Jesus gave many teachings about the kingdom of heaven. It's like a woman who took a patch of dough and put leaven in it and spread and so on. And the gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world and then the end shall come. This should be so exciting to us. For the first time it's possible for even, you know, for it to be preached in all the world, for even a nobody like me or you, to spread the word to our friends and neighbors or on internet like I'm doing. Get the gospel out. The true, complete, full gospel. That's why I'm giving this sermon. I don't want to give a sermon just about the kingdom of God. I don't want to give a sermon just about Jesus. I want the whole kit and caboodle. I want all the marvels, all of it. So, but someone like me can actually be part of getting this world to know about the true gospel. It's just so exciting. And that you have a part in fulfilling that by sharing that with others. You know, Elon Musk says he's going to put satellites over every village in America and the world and Africa and Asia so that there's internet throughout all the world, which means everybody will soon be able to, if they have a smartphone, be able to Listen to the gospel accounts from various ones, including mine. And the time will come that the final kingdoms on earth, spoken of in Daniel 2, will be smashed by the stone that comes out of heaven, this rock that comes out of heaven and smashes it on the feet. Daniel 2, verses 31 to 45. And then the, all of man's kind king, kingdoms disappear like chaff. And the stone from God that his kingdom was will grow over time, but not all at once. Hey, you guys, the kingdom of God, the millennium even, when Christ returns, this earth is going to look like a worldwide battlefield like that's been hit by war and nuclear war and hurricanes and earthquakes and volcanic eruption and tornadoes and everything all at once, everywhere. Total disaster. It's not going to look like the Garden of Eden for many, many, many years. We're not going to have everybody obeying God for many years. It takes many years for Egypt to come and keep the, the uh, Feast of Tabernacles. So the millennium, well, first of all, what is the kingdom of God? The millennium is going to be ruled by resurrected saints and God, Christ, 
these resurrected saints are then spirit beings. This mortal shall put on immortality. And there are different glories like the glory, like 1 Corinthians 15 explains all that. I don't believe the millennium is the completed, polished, finished kingdom of God yet. It's ruled by the kingdom of God. In my opinion, it cannot be itself described as the kingdom of God. The lion and the lamb and the little child and the, and the leopard and the goat and all that. Isaiah, what is it, 9, I think, verses 6 to 9. They're flesh and blood. And look what we read in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 50. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 50 to 54. This I say now, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot, cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does corruption inherit incorruption. The kingdom of God, there's nothing corrupting up there. There's nothing decaying up there. It's not flesh and blood up there. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep. We shall all be changed. In a moment, twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet, the trumpet will sound. The dead will be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption. This mortal must put on immortality. They're going to not ever be able, they're going to be able to never die again. The, the, the death has no power over them after this point. Other people, okay, those of us in the first resurrection, it says in Revelation 20, I think it's verse 5 and 6, or 4, 5, 6, whatever it is, Revelation 20, that those in the first resurrection, the second death has no power over them. They're not going to die ever again. The other people who survive into the millennium, who aren't changed to spirit, those people are still flesh and blood. They're not in the kingdom of God. They're being ruled by us and Christ. We shall be kings and priests and rule them from on the earth, Revelation 5.10. But it's, the kingdom of God is still that stone that's spreading and spreading and spreading. It's still not finished yet. Plus the kingdom of heaven. So the first reason why I don't feel I should call the millennium the kingdom of God, like almost everybody seems to, I don't think that's right. I think it's ruled by the kingdom of God. Don't get me wrong. But it's not the kingdom of God because flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. I feel like I'm singing a song here. <laughs> Plus in the kingdom of heaven, God's will is always done. We even prayed in Matthew 6, verse 9 and 10. We prayed in there. So... Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So in heaven, when God says something, it's done. The will of God is always done, but not on earth, apparently. Because we have free moral agency. That's why it's not done always on earth. Because we can decide, no, I don't want to follow you. I don't want to obey you. So in the kingdom of heaven, there's no rebellion. There's no bad attitude. There are no bad attitudes. There's no f uh, war. And yet we find during the millennium, at the end of the millennium, after the millennium, in fact, Satan is released. Revelation 20, verses 7 to 9. And he goes about and once again deceives the nations into rebelling and defying Christ. They weren't completely sold on it. And so they come and attack the camp of the, of, of the saints, maybe Feast of Tabernacles. Who knows what's going on there? Something's happening. So I don't believe I can say that the kingdom of God is the millennium. It's ruled by the millennium, leading up to the kingdom of God, which then we actually see in Revelation 21 and 22, the first verses of Revelation 21, Then I saw new heavens and new earth, for the old heaven and earth had passed away. I want to give a real detailed sermon on what is the kingdom of God in a nutshell. It already exists in heaven. It's made up 100% right now of spirit beings called God and angels and Christ. And after the resurrection, his resurrected saints will be part of that kingdom, period. Flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. And his will is always done. I think even the city of Jerusalem, even the city of Jerusalem, uh, the gates, the streets, all of it 
is made up of spirit. Why would you, why would you put fleshly, physical things when, when you have access to spirit? I believe even the spirit, even the city of heavenly Jerusalem, its walls, its gates, its streets, its buildings, they are, in my view at least, more likely to be made entirely of spirit. And the reason I believe that is because this corruption can't put on incorruption. There's nothing corruptible in heaven. And Jesus had said in Matthew 6, verses 19 and 20, Jesus had said, invest in the kingdom of heaven because there, there's no moth that will corrupt things. There's no rust. There's no decay. There's no corruption. Therefore, it must be spirit, I really believe. Everything in the heavenly Jerusalem is spirit. And that's the real thing, okay? We're supposed to seek that kingdom of God and his righteousness. And if we do, God will provide everything we could ever want. And we're going to become heirs of God, co-heirs with Christ. So what's, uh, what's more descriptive than, than all that? So what's, what's, the, what's the most descriptive uh, definition of the gospel, the true gospel? It's all the above. It's so much bigger than people realize. I'm almost tempted to think that, to say that the kingdom of the gospel of the kingdom of God is really every word in the Bible. It's talking about the good news for sure of grace. It's talking about salvation for sure of Jesus Christ. It's talking about Jesus for sure. It's talking about the kingdom of God for sure. It's talking about the way into that kingdom for sure. All of those. I'm going to give you two scriptures that give you that more complete way of saying it. Acts 20, verse 24 and 25. We read 24. We did not read 25. Let's read it again. Acts 20, 24. He's talking to the Ephesians, the elders. And then he says at the end of verse 24, to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. The gospel of grace. Gospel of the grace of God. Verse 25, indeed, I now know that you all, among whom I've gone preaching, the kingdom of God. So here in two verses, he's saying, my message to you is the gospel of the grace of God, by which and into which and through which we're able to come into that wonderful good news of the kingdom of God as well. So the good news is really about the teachings of the whole Bible, I think. Certainly much more than just isolating it to just the kingdom or just about Jesus or just about grace or just about salvation. Put all those together, the whole counsel of God. Don't resist it. Don't deny Christ. And don't deny the kingdom. Acts 28, verse 30, 31, Then Paul dwelt two whole years in his own rented house. Here's the next one, Acts 28. Look at the bolded words. I want you to just glance right at them real quickly. That's why I put them in bold. And received all those who came to him, preaching the kingdom of God. And teaching the things which concern the Lord Jesus Christ. Now it doesn't say preaching the gospel of the kingdom, but I guess it could, but it doesn't. But it does say that's what he preached, the kingdom of God. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 1 and 2, he says he came preaching Jesus, in, in verse 3, that Jesus died for us. Here he says he came preaching the kingdom of God. And teaching the things which concern the Lord Jesus Christ with all confidence, no one forbidding him. Are you getting it? This is more the gospel. Now, there are many other descriptions of the Bible in the Bible about the gospel. Um, Mark 1, 14, after John was put in prison, Jesus came to Galilee preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God and saying the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. Believe in the gospel, the, the good news. The good news was also about himself. I've come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. Was the good news, John 10.10. 10. I am the good shepherd. I am the true vine. Abide in me and you'll bear much fruit. That's good news about Jesus. But it's also the gospel of the kingdom of God, as we just read, that Jesus came preaching. 
So don't deny that gospel, any of you. And we know over and over how Jesus said we must believe in him. And if we do, we have eternal life. John 3.16 and John 3.36, John 6.47, they're all there. In Romans 10, it talks about here in Romans 10, uh, how, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the gospel of peace, who bring glad tidings, good news of good things. But they have not all obeyed the gospel. The good news has to be obeyed. It includes, like the everlasting gospel of the angel, fear God, worship him, obey that. Ephesians 1.13, the gospel of your salvation. And when we do that, when we believe the gospel of our salvation and receive the Holy Spirit, we're sealed with the Holy Spirit, guaranteeing our salvation. So to have salvation, we need a Savior. And we know his name is Jesus, Yeshua, which means Savior. That's real good news. I was doomed to die the second death. Couldn't get out of it on my own. I needed someone to come and say, you know what? I'm taking all the accusations and penalties against you upon myself. I can do that because I have no sin. I can do that for everyone because I am the Son of God. And therefore, my life is worth more than just one other person. I can do that because I'm willing to die for you and have died for you. I can do that because I'm the Lamb of God. And my blood will wash away your sins. I'm your Redeemer. I'm your rock. I'm your hope. And my name is Jesus. My name is Yeshua, which means Savior. Hallelujah. So now my sins are gone. I've been saved. Wretched man that I am, been saved by amazing grace, by Jesus Christ. So because of that, Ephesians 6.15, I want to put my shoes of the preparation of the gospel of peace and go out and let everybody know. I'm trying to do that now on this website. And now we put on the new shoes of salvation and peace in the gospel. Yes, you should do it. When Stephen was stoned in Acts 7, first martyr, other than Christ, but the first disciple who was killed. In Acts 8, verse 1, Saul was consenting to their death. At that time, a great persecution arose against the church at Jerusalem, and they were scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria except the apostles. Apostles stayed there. So what we're about to read was not the apostles. Verse 4, therefore those who were scattered, says it's the brethren. Okay, those who were scattered went everywhere preaching the word. The apostles stayed. We read about what happened in Acts 11, verses 19 to 21. Now those who were scattered after the persecution that arose, they traveled everywhere preaching the word, initially to the Jews only, eventually to Hellenists. These were Greeks who took on Judaism. Preaching the Lord Jesus. End of verse 20, in bold letters. And the hand of the Lord was with them, and a great number believed and turned to the Lord. It says right after that, Jesus was really pleased with this. He was pleased with it. The hand of the Lord was with them. He was pleased with them. So, Again, there are many other descriptions. Gospel of the grace of God, we've already talked about that and, uh, and, and getting the whole counsel of God. There's still some other um, descriptions. I think I've given you just about mo most of them now. But Jesus had told the disciples, go out and preach the gospel to all the world. What did they actually preach? I'm going to speak quickly here. There's no record of them no, I shouldn't say that, but here's what they mostly preached about. Acts 2, Peter's Pentecost sermon was all about Jesus being the Messiah whom they killed. 
Then he told them to repent and be baptized for the remission of sins. Acts 3, the great healings were by Jesus Christ. Acts 4, no other name given under heaven by which we must be saved. Acts 4, verse 12. Acts 8, Philip in Samaria went preaching Christ. Verse 5. Acts 8, verse 12. They should all be on the screen. He preached the kingdom of God and the name of Christ. Acts 8, 35 to the Ethiopian eunuch. Philip preached Jesus to him. Doesn't it say Jesus Christ? Just Jesus. Don't be... I don't know why some groups just always say Christ or Jesus Christ. They just never say Jesus. Some. Acts 9, verse 20, the first things Paul preached was Christ. After he was called by Jesus Christ himself, knocked off his high horse. He was on his way to Damascus to arrest a bunch of uh, believers. You know the story in Acts 9. As soon as he was healed of his blindness, the first thing it says about him, Acts 9, verse 20, was that he went to the synagogues preaching that Jesus was the Christ. Acts 10, verses 33 to 40, 34 to 43, Peter talking to Cornelius, centurion and his family. The whole discussion, you can go back and read it, was about Jesus Christ. Again, the words gospel of the kingdom. Gospel of the kingdom are not used in any of the epistles, but they certainly did preach Christ. They certainly did preach the kingdom as well. But it seems to me that mostly Christ, if you're honest with all the scriptures. 1 Corinthians 2.2, Paul says, I determined not to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. Would you say the same thing? If someone tells me, tell me what you know about the Bible, would you say what I really want to tell you about in the Bible is the story of the Son of God Jesus the Christ, the Messiah, the Anointed One, and how he was crucified for us and for you. What would you boast about? In Galatians 6, verse 14, it says, God forbid that I should boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. For in Christ Jesus, everything else, circumcision, uncircumcision, doesn't mean anything but a new creation. 2 Corinthians 5.17, we are now new creations in Christ. Jesus is the way. He's the new life. Galatians 2.20, I no longer live the life I live. I live by faith in, in the Son of God who gave himself for me, who loved me, gave himself for me. Verse 21, we rarely read. For if I could be justified or, or declared righteous by works of the law, then Christ died in vain. Let that sink in. Colossians 3, verse 3 and 4. Christ, who is now our lives. Okay? He's now our life. He makes us that new creation, which is himself living in us. Yeah, we still have the old one. Don't focus on that. Focus on the new one. The new one is perfect. The old one, which we still have, we got to resist and fight and kick out. But it's the new one that God looks at, the new creation. And like the early church, we can't stop talking about him, the center of the gospel of God, concerning his son. Romans 1, 3, right? No bride out there. If you're being called to be at the wedding supper of the Lamb, either as a bride or a guest, or we hope bride, you can't stop talking about the one you're going to marry. And it's Father's and God's good news that he loved the world so much that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And what a price he paid because he loves you and wants you there. How much are you worth to God? Yes, you, sinful you sometimes. We repent of those things. We still sin sometimes. What price did he pay for you? the blood and the life of his very own son. That's the price he paid. Even for me. No matter how bad you've been or I've been, he paid that price. 
Now, those of you who already believe, teach, and know about the gospel of Christ, and his grace and his salvation, my point to you is there's also a kingdom to learn about and preach. It's more than just going to heaven if you die. We'll talk about that sometime. But it's a kingdom of love. It's a kingdom that is going to be good news. We're going to be bombarded by good news as we go through the millennium itself and then into the kingdom of God. Lots of good news. Whereas the kingdoms of this world, the kingdoms of Satan, the god of this world, you turn on the news, there are times I don't even want to watch the news. I know it's going to be bad. Crime and inflation and wars, people dying and people being attacked and pandemics. Who cares about what, all that? That's not good news. So the kingdom of God is coming to replace all that bad news with the good news of the kingdom. The gospel that Jesus came preaching was the gospel of the kingdom of God. So of course it's the kingdom as well. So let's end part one with that. And Jesus commanded his disciples to go preach the gospel. And uh, kingdom and Jesus and grace and peace and salvation and the everlasting gospel to fear and worship God. That's the, that's the good news. In part two, I want to go through more of what they actually preached. I want to go through mostly, though, how the gospel, the good news, was preached from Adam and Eve onwards, all through the Old Testament. I th you'll see Yeshua, you'll see Jesus glorified in that gospel. Like I had a sermon I just gave on how Jesus, Yeshua, is revealed in the Old Testament scriptures. And I want to magnify on that. Then I also want to talk about what is the kingdom of God within that part two. What's it like? What's it going to be like? And uh, are you ready for it? Salvation, eternal life, heirs of God. You're an heir of God. Many of you in Kenya and Tanzania are so poor. So poor. You go from hand to mouth. You earn enough to pay for just enough to buy something to eat for you and your family. And it's not going to be much. Then tomorrow you have nothing again. And you don't have a fridge. You don't have a car. You don't have, many of you don't have anything around the world. You're an heir of God, joint heir, co-heir with Jesus of all things out there. Don't give up this calling you've had. It's going to be great and grand. So go out preaching the gospel of the kingdom made possible by the good news of Jesus Christ, the grace of God, giving us salvation and eternal life, forgiveness, and making us heirs of God. I'm sharing with you right now. Now you go and you do your sharing. Let's dismiss. Our Father in heaven, we come to you and we raise our hands in joy and gratitude to you and thank you for the good news you've given us, the good news of Jesus Christ, that in him we will have access happily, excitedly into your kingdom and be part of everlasting life in a kingdom that's beyond description. So incredible that Paul wasn't even allowed to say anything about it. We know hard times are coming, but let us know that you're with us and we're with you. Please, dear Father in heaven, anoint us with your Holy Spirit and anoint us with understanding. Help us have the way to go out there and share what we know and bring more people into this good news. We praise you. We ask you as we reach up to you to reach down, pick us up, Hold us in your arms, Father. Smile upon us. Look with joy upon us as we try to live in our living the life of Jesus Christ in us. May he be our life and our new creation. Yes, Father, we praise you. We love you. We thank you so much. Protect us from Satan. Protect us from pandemics. Protect us from disasters. Protect us from persecution that's violent in so many parts of the world, and help our brethren who are suffering violence. Help them have a way out, Father. Please watch over them. We praise you and we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Visit the Light on the Rock website, where you can view additional videos, over 600 sermons and blogs, as a scriptural study reference for those who desire to have a closer relationship with God the Father and His Son, Jesus Christ, 
and learn more about his incredible plan for all mankind. We are not a church, but a nonprofit organization providing in depth biblical studies free for all who would like to visit our site. The Light on the Rock Foundation also supports an orphanage in Kenya, providing financial resources to support their living costs and education. We never ask for money. However, any donations are greatly appreciated and will be used to support the Kenyan Orphanage and our site. Thank you for visiting, and if you find the site beneficial to you and your family, please share with others.